with the Burners Without Borders team. I'm very excited to say hello to my friend and co-host, Christopher Breedlove. Hello, Christopher. Hey, Molly, and hey, everybody. I'm Christopher Breedlove. Uh, BWB is a program of the Burning Man Project, and we seek to promote and amplify civic impact and something that's inherently alive in our community around the world. This Burners Without Borders worldwide call is an opportunity to drop in, and spotlight one particular theme or topic of projects. These worldwide calls bring us together, meet each other, and hopefully provide a scaffolding to connect and collaborate more deeply out there in the world. So that's just a little bit of an introduction into what we're doing here tonight. And I'm now gonna pass it over to Christopher to tell us more about the specifics of tonight's topic. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm just going to quickly share my screen here and say, so I don't know if you have ever noticed at Burning Man, but once you start looking for a symbol, it the, starts to show up everywhere. And so maybe you're looking around and you see a sculpture. Well, and then, of course, there we go. Then you maybe find an experience. And then you go around again and you find another sculpture. And then all of a sudden you find a theme camp. And then all of a sudden you start to see that symbol engraved on art pieces all around. And then maybe you even hear a quote by Larry Harvey, the founder of Burning Man. We make the hive and they bring the honey talking about how burners come together. So what we've been noticing in BWB this year is there's a lot of things going on with bees in the community. And uh, we think that part of that has to do with the theme of Anomalia, but it also probably has to do with how amazing these creatures, our friends are. And so one of the things that we've realized in Burners Without Borders is that sometimes we can raise a flag up over a topic and what happens is, is that all of these people come out of the woodwork, or maybe really they come out of the hive and they tell us what they're doing. So that was really our intention here today to bring together uh, burners who are interested in bees in a couple of different ways. And, you know, we're going to have some amazing speakers. We're going to have three of them. Each are going to have 10 minutes. Then we're going to do a little Q&A, and then we'll have a chance to go out into breakout rooms after that. And they're really going to tell you about bees. But... To kind of just start at that really high level, I just really want to say that, right, bees are a keystone species. They're, if not the most, they're one of the most important pollinators on the planet, because without them, we know that they are essential in pollinating a variety of crops, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, which means that they're not only essential for the ecosystems, but they're essential for us as well, right? They play a critical role in biodiversity and supporting wildlife. They help maintain habitats of flowers, which is also other homes for other creatures. And unfortunately, today, bees are facing a whole bunch of challenges. Those include habitat loss, pesticide use, and climate change. And so what we really need to do is raise the awareness around what's going on and ideally connect with people who are stewarding these amazing creatures. So I don't need to say anything more because I'm not a bee expert. I'm just an enthusiast. And I'm going to hand it over to Molly to tell us which one of our speakers is coming up first. Thank you, Christopher. And honestly, that did make me feel enthusiastic. I loved learning all of those facts about uh, bees, our keystone species. So first... We're going to be hearing from three projects today, and we're going to introduce each of them directly before their presentation. So I'm very excited to share our first presenter today. Charlotte de Casabianca is an artist and entrepreneur and one of the founders of Burners Without Borders Bogota, the Burners Without Borders working group in Colombia. BWB Bogota has demonstrated a lot of passion and leadership in their first few years as a group. And they've worked on projects related to career support for youth who lack resources in their local community alongside ecological conservation efforts. So Charlotte is sharing with us today about the second project hosted by BWB Bogota, Be Safe. The project leaders are Catalina Guevara and Pablo Escola. So shout out to those two. And with that, I'll let Charlotte take it away to share about Be Safe. 
Thank you so much, Molly. Thank you all for connecting this evening. It's truly a joy to present to such a cool burner slash be loving crowd. So I'm going to go ahead and share that screen. And we're on. So yes, we're BWB Colombia, one of the very few chapters in Latin America. So can I get some emoji love, first of all, in this chat for our sweet Latino representation tonight? Arriba Colombia. <laughs> I know there's a few Colombians in the chat tonight. So um, you may have noticed I'm not Latina myself. I'm French, but I landed in Colombia 12 years ago and I just never left. Uh, so watch out because our project is going to make you fall in love with Colombia too. Consider yourself warned. So three facts about us. Basically, let me see why this yes here we go okay so we're one year old one of the most recent uh chapters here we're about 50 volunteers and we have three ongoing projects that i would be happy to uh to tell you about in the breakout rooms later but we are here to talk about be safe so before i get started with the introduction of our project i would like to give some context about our country right and however this nature is under threat a bit of geography 101 here with this map surprise Colombia is not in South Carolina <laughs> so according to the WWF around half of Colombia's ecosystems are critically threatened while a third of its plants and half its animals are at risk of habitat loss so who are the usual suspects well oil mineral metal extraction deforestation wildlife trafficking, and also the impact of the cocaine trade are all playing their part in this threat, which continues in spite of the fact that, in theory, around 10% of Colombia's national territory is protected. But what we've witnessed is that top-down efforts are useless if the people themselves don't act upon the urgency to protect their ecosystems. And so this is why Be Safe invites the local communities to take ownership and to well help us optimize the impact on our lovely beneficiaries that you're going to see the stingless native bees that we call angelitas they are the only ones which can pollinate the native flora so they are we could say the guardians of our most ancestral habitats which is quite a responsibility our local impact takes place precisely in a non-protected area in Cundinamarca, which is a, a rural department contiguous to Bogota, our capital city. And we go to Sipacon, which is a gorgeous town of 5,000 souls founded in the 16th century, only 50 kilometers away from Bogota, but it actually takes us three hours to get there. As you can see on the map, the relief of the terrain can explain why. The roads are pretty complicated. We are in the frigging and these guys. So this zone has been particularly affected by a pesticide molecule that is called fipronil uh, that was registered in the US in 96. And it's, it devastated nature very quickly. Uh, since 2010, the Colombian Agricultural Institute reports that beekeepers have lost an estimate of 9 billion bees on a national scale. Um, the main users, on one hand, industrial agriculture, because they use it to remove pests on crops, but also the regular folks in the countryside who spray the bees in their nests to get rid of them. The first rural school that we impacted, you can see on the map, the green point is the school Laguna Verde. 
And since then, BSAFE has won a BWB micro grant, and we are replicating our efforts in three more schools. So I would like to show you what a day on the field with our BWB volunteers, our partners um, from NGO Campo Colombia, and also the QT Chiqui students of Laguna Verde look like. Christopher, over to you. proyecto B6 en la escuela Laguna Verde en Zipacol. La idea de este proyecto es hacer 10 colmenas de abejas con la comunidad, los niños y sus padres de esta escuela en Zipacol. Hoy vamos a hacer una actividad bien bonita que esperemos que perdure por muchos años y por muchas generaciones. Y bueno, descubrimos que la UNESCO decretó como la abeja es el ser vivo más importante de nuestro planeta a través de polinizar la, la, las florcitas, que son, cogen el polen de una flor y lo llevan para otro lado y así va ayudando en nuestro ecosistema. Y hay muchas especies y hay algunas que están en peligro de extinción y hay otras que la gente no sabe y les da miedo y las matan o pues las espantan. Y la verdad es que las abejas, como les decía, es el ser vivo más importante de nuestro planeta, pues hay que ayudarla y sobre todo eh, a la gente enseñarle que hay que cuidarlas. Entonces, una de las formas es lo que vamos a hacer nosotros acá con ustedes, en la zona verde, que es traer unos atrayentes, los atrayentes como dice la palabra, para atraer a las abejas, igual la gente de Campo Colombia nos va a estar guiando con todo este proceso, y crear unas colmenas. Las colmenas es donde están las abejitas. ¿Cómo? Exacto. Las casas donde es con una casa y además con una fábrica, porque ahí hacen la miel. Que la miel, a futuro, ustedes la pueden recoger, la pueden consumir, o si ya tenemos algo más grande, se puede comercializar, se puede vender, porque además no es que le estamos quitando la comida a las artistas, porque las artistas hacen eso y les sobra muchísima miel si la tenemos bien equipada. ¿no? ¿Cómo es una abeja? Eh, es amarilla. ¿Amarilla? ¿Qué más? Es este, ¿Acuérdense sí, qué? ¿Listo? Por acá ella había levantado una mano. Amarilla y negra. Ok, ¿tú qué más ibas a decir? Si empezamos desde ya con nuestros niños, con nuestros pequeños estudiantes a, a sensibilizarnos en este tema, de seguro que vamos a tener cierto, cierto impacto y vamos a tratar de minimizar eh, estas acciones que les, 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 nosotros los adultos estamos eh, haciendo a, nuestra, a nuestro medio ambiente. Hice concursos y aprendí las abejas que no toca matarlas. Toca ayudarla sobre, sobre todo lo que ellas hacen para nosotros. Enseñamos las abejas. 
Bueno, una vez elaborados estos atrayentes, lo que vamos a hacer es traerlos a campo. Vamos a ubicar sitios donde sean como atractivos para las abejas y los vamos a instalar. Este es un sitio bonito, aquí hemos colocado una piedrita inclusive para ayudarle a dar ángulo y los vamos a instalar y a fijar. Eh, de este modo con el tiempo algunas de las abejitas que se van a dividir van a buscar casa y lo van a escoger como una nueva casa y de una forma digámoslo así muy natural sin abrir árboles y sin nada vamos a ir obteniendo material biológico para que los niños vayan fortaleciendo sus meliponarios entonces dispositivos como este los vamos a instalar en un alto número de, pues, de predios, alrededor de unas 50 botellas se van a instalar o más si vemos que se requiere, vamos a ir obteniendo este material biológico y una vez lo tengamos se pasan desde las botellitas a cajitas como las que eh, vamos a ver pintadas y allí pues vamos a ir fortaleciendo y las vamos a utilizar pues como una herramienta pedagógica para que ellos aprendan sobre el cuidado de ellas y, y el aporte al medio ambiente. Bueno, el número de, de abejitas que se recoge en cada dispositivo puede variar dependiendo de la especie. Aquí en esta zona esperamos tener principalmente una especie que le dicen angelita, eh, que tiene nidos más o menos de 2.000 abejas, como pues, estamos eh, esperando alrededor de unas 10, pues estaríamos aportando como a 20.000 eh, abejas a enriquecer pues, el territorio acá con este proyecto. Lo que queremos es poder replicar esta historia y por eso queremos hacerlo tres veces más con tres escuelas diferentes que puedan ayudar a preservar esta especie tan importante para el planeta. Estamos comprometidos a salvar la abeja nativa de Colombia. Ayúdenos. And I'm back, wait a second, here, okay, do you, do you see me presenting again? Yep. Yes? Okay, yeah, but this is not the right one, where am I? Here, yes, okay, sorry, so as you can see, what we're doing is pretty cool, we get to paint hives with kids, to learn about the bees, to educate their parents as well, to try to change habits and not, not kill the bees anymore when they come into their house because they're lost. Um, and so our mission really is the conservation of the native bee habitat. We have a great advantage. Our bees don't have stings. So this is why we can work with kids safely. This is why we can put the meliponary inside of the school. We can touch them. Um, and, and so that is, that is a great advantage. Um, obviously colony repopulation, because we're talking about a habitat that was, that was clearly, uh, well, deforested and harmed. And we would like to go back to, uh, the original amounts of bees that were thriving there. Um, local community education and empowerment may be in the further stage, we will, uh, give advice and help the community to have their own brand of bee products, who knows if that is something that they realize is um, an opportunity for them as well. Uh, we would love to support them. Um, and we do all that by sprinkling a bit of Burning Man celebration spirit. We bring lunch, we have fun, and we tackle the principles of participation and leave no trace. Um, so how's it going for us? Well, our goal for 2024 is to establish a, a corridor, a hive network between seven rural schools uh, in which about 140,000 bees would thrive. So far, we have four active hotspots. Laguna Verde, this is where we shot the movie, um, is our most advanced point. We already have our 10 hives um, over there and the colony will be complete by October. The three other points shall be complete by March 2024. It takes roughly uh, 15 months to do the whole process and to have the bees uh, colonizing the spaces that we prepare for them. Um, and so what happens is that we had to reduce our impact in the other points. So this is why we have eight hives instead of 10 in the new schools because we are facing budget restrictions. Um, and so we are missing a total of 36 hives because we would also like to add three more schools to, uh, to the network. Mm, and each additional hive brings 2000 bees, 
which can pollinate 300 million flowers in a day. So the impact is fabulous. Um, as we know, about 75% of the world's crops depend on pollinators. And one hive costs $30. So I know you're thinking, okay, that's ridiculously cheap. How come they're not done with their project already? The thing is the average monthly salary in Colombia is around $400. So it's actually getting worse with the recent devaluation of the peso. and. Uh, uh, basically, the dollar goes a very long way. So this is why I would like to use this opportunity to please ask you to consider contributing to our efforts. I can share our PayPal link later. And when you come visit Colombia, be sure to reach out to our BWB gang. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. So great to hear about this project. Uh, we don't have time for questions. If you want to go ahead and unshare your screen. Uh, we don't have time for questions right now, but we will have Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, please hold on to them for Charlotte, because we'd love for you to ask them. And in the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and move right into introducing our next presenter, who I've been very excited to meet through this process. Tim Brem Bremner is a designer, artist, and creative director out of Oakland, whose design was chosen for this year's iconic man base. Yay. He's been a burner since 2001 and a large scale artist on the playa since 2010. His last installation was La Victrola, which is a 35 foot tall Art Nouveau gramophone that hit the playa in 2016 and 2017. So he's a part time historian of all things Burning Man and has a passion for the evolution of art installations and community that builds them. And that's what keeps him coming back. So today, we're talking about Tim's newest Burning Man art design for the iconic man base, inspired by the dwelling shape of bee communities, a hive. So Tim, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great, thanks. Let me uh, share my screen, make sure everybody can see this. All right, hopefully that works. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take you guys through kind of, I, this is kind of more the entertainment part of the, the program. Um, I'm going to take you through kind of the process of submitting the art for the man base and what my concept was and uh, how that works and kind of go into detail on what inspired it and everything like that. So um, first of all is kind of the, ooh, hold on, there we go. Um, is what happens. So I was uh, asked to submit a couple, there's like a handful of artists that are asked to submit, um, knowing the concept once the theme of Burning Man is announced, you know, you know what the theme is, we want you to kind of submit a proposal for the base of the man. Um, the main requirements are it needs to burn beautifully, act as a centerpiece and gathering place and shade structure for the citizens of Black Rock City, and then actually be buildable. Um, the timeline was one month to design, and um, the artist's involvement is basically once they choose the design, you have a couple meetings where you kind of hand off the concept to the man-based team, and then that's it. So they are engineering, architecting, designing, getting ready to build it, and I don't have anything to do, which is pretty amazing as an artist, because most projects are just a lot of money budgeting and running. So... Um, I'll take you through what I submitted. Again, another caveat is this is what I want it to be, what it'll actually be. There's so many other factors when they build something of this scale, safety, burnability, budget, all these things. So it will look different, but it'll still be as close as they can get it to these original designs. So I started off with the same quote that uh, Breedlove mentioned, which is that, you know, we make the hive, they bring the honey. As I was thinking about inspiration from the animal kingdom of like what structure would be perfect, I just had, I just kept coming back to this analogy of the hive and bees and Burning Man just being this crazy thing. And then when I heard this quote, I just thought it was like the perfect analogy. So I started off with this concept of the analogy about Burning Man. So, you know, a hive is a home to a colony. The colony is made up of three groups and three groups only. I mean, this is my limited knowledge. Um, the queen, which lays the eggs, initiates swarms, regulates hive activity and well-being. That's what the org is. That's their purpose. The workers, they build the honeycomb. They clean, they explore, they nurse, they procure and distribute food and water. They gather and refine nectar. 
that is basically everybody else, the artists, the participants, the volunteers, and the theme camps. Then there's this group of people called the drones. Their one purpose is to basically spread the word and meet with virgins. So we've got that too. We've got our sparkle ponies, our Instagram influencer people, and our plug-in players. So we're all kind of, we have our little roles um, and we exist in this beautifully designed layout of a city. Um, so I felt, you know, like the proper bee colony, that's what I would propose was the hive. So that's where we are. So five towers of stacked hexagons rise from the desert floor, elevating the man above the fray and serving as the center of the hive that's Black Rock City. The towers are then surrounded by elevated stages and these walls of oversized honeycomb that provide shade and little intimate spots for conversation or performance. One of the best comments on the black on the journal post for this was somebody called them burner cubbies, which I think is fantastic because that's basically what they are, these little honeycombs. Um, to create the layered look of a honeycomb, some of the chambers in the walls are covered with kind of woven or patterned screens that filter the moving sun in intricate ways. And this plays into this kind of fun accident that I had while designing, which is the nighttime design. So I wanted this kind of golden honey hued lighting scheme that was super simple. And I wanted the towers to be lit from inside. And when I did that, I realized that all the kind of layered hexagons on top, they start to look like bees because everything is like striped. And so this kind of illusion that's created when it's lit up at night would be, uh, hopefully they can do this, it would just be a really killer kind of thing because it's just, it completely changes the vibe of the actual sculpture. So now I'll take you into kind of the, the meat and bones of everything of how did this thing like comes together and it's kind of this layered sculpture as you can see the scale with these little people down here it's pretty big it may not be that big i'm not sure i wasn't allowed to change the height of the man is always 36 feet but underneath it can grow or shrink depending on the size of the build and how it gets engineered for safety and everything but we like things big so i made it big as you start to peel away these layers you can kind of see what you know, that was taking away all the honeycombs on the outside. The central part is this tower or cluster of towers of these big hexagons that with these kind of outdoor stages where people can do performances or, you know, do whatever they want to do. Um, this is kind of the side view. So from the three o'clock and the, and the um, nine o'clock sides, you know, you have to think about how this thing looks from every side of the city because it's such a kind of important focal point. So same thing here, taking away those layers and you can kind of see the profile of the, the man base. This is the overhead view, where in the center you've got your kind of towers and they all have like doors so you can go from one to another. And then there are these overhangs and skylights that are made of hexagons. Um, and this is kind of a 3D view of, of what it looks like. So it's kind of walls surrounding a courtyard and then you have your central tower. So one of the things that interested me about bees is that they are uh, beehives is that it's one size of a hexagon just repeated, you know, these little chambers are all the same size and they're just repeated over and over again and they grow in this organic form. But that basic unit is so strong and so simple. And so I thought as I was designing this, it would be cool to do this out of basically two shapes. So I have two size hexagons, one with four foot sides and one with eight foot sides. And if you're a builder, four by eight are good dimensions because plywood, plywood sheets come in four by eight sizes. So I'm trying to eliminate the amount of cuts they have to do. So it's kind of a nod to the people that are gonna be slaving in the sun building this thing. So I did everything in just these two shapes, all of the honeycombs on the outside and the decorative ones on the towers are the four foot size. And then the ones that make up the towers are the eight foot per side uh, hexagons. So the whole thing is just those two. It allows it to be scalable if they need to make it smaller or bigger or whatever they want to do. The next part is to get all that layered look. I wanted to have some sort of thing that could indicate that some of the chambers are closed like a natural beehive is, um, but I can't use vellum or transparent paper because when it burns it just has all these 
embers and is problematic for everybody and is just creates moot. So I saw this kind of idea of doing screens out of rope or twine, and I thought that would be a really cool way to get that same transparent, opaque view. So that's kind of what I'm indicating here. The next couple pages are just to show the inspiration. So as a person in my work for what I do is to try to kind of inspire a whole creative team to, to do things. And I'm having to kind of hand off this concept to the whole man-based team. And so I wanted to kind of give them lots of inspiration regardless of whatever kind of obstacles they run into, they could kind of look back at the next series of images to kind of come up with other solutions because I won't be a part of the process. So this is just more on that, like how have other people done cool screens of hexagons before that are transparent and what do those look like? Um, what are different ways of thinking about that in kind of an architectural way? Um, or, you know, when I was researching, had anybody else done cool hexagons out there? There was this really neat beehive project that was done in 2010 that people climbed all over, um, or other kind of designers and architects around the world that have created these different shapes using just that one hexagon. Um, then also, because I'm using oversized ones, it's like, how do people interact with these? Do they climb all over them? Can you make benches and things like that? Um, inside them. And so that's kind of what this slide indicates. And then inside, you know, do people want to do cool bee art or make neat little lanterns hanging down or whatever. So I just kind of, again, wanted to share all the research that I had done with the team that's going to be making all these different parts of the hive. And that's it. So that's kind of the thought process of this whole thing. And, um, you know, it's fun to be able to build a I have for our community. So I'm looking forward to what it looks like when we get out there. And that's it. Great. Thanks so much, Tim. I think that's a super inspiring centerpiece for our community this year. So, you know, one of the things we talk about sometimes in BWB is this concept of here, there, and everywhere. So we were just here in Black Rock City with Tim. We were just everywhere with BWB Bogota. And now we're going to go over there, which is what we call Northern Nevada. So I'm going to introduce Massimo Mazzarotto. He's a dedicated entrepreneur with a passion for Burning Man culture and innovation. With over 20 years of experience, he's been focusing on live immersive experiences that captivate audiences and he works tirelessly to expand the popularity of sustainable everyday products and to promote ethical businesses practices in the corporate world. Originally from Italy, Massimo moved to Northern California a few years ago with the goal of connecting with like-minded individuals and contributing to the creation of better living systems in harmony with nature. Massimo, welcome and tell us what you are up to. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Burns Without Borders. And first thing I wanna say, uh, Charlotte and Tim, congratulations. I love your projects. I love what you're doing. So inspiring. Great job. Um, I'm going to share a little presentation here now. Okay, great. Awesome. So I've been lucky enough to be part of the uh, Fly Ranch um, community for about a year and a half now. And um, I've been working with the people there, well, just an introduction, Fly Ranch is about a 3,800-acre ranch in northern Nevada, uh, is home of the Fly Geyser, and projects there are organized by thousands of participants and tend to focus on reconnecting, healing, and the land. Uh, Fly Ranch goal is to produce public benefit as an agricultural site with sustainable food systems for water, food, uh, power, shelter, waste, and air. So when I arrived at Fly Ranch, uh, being a beekeeper as a background, I noticed some bee boxes that were abandoned there. And I also, for the laggy um, contest, design contest to populate this land with artwork and installations, I proposed a, a pollinator sanctuary. That didn't get selected, but uh, caught the attentions of the founders. And eventually we managed to pull together a little group of folks that have met informally for the past few months and created a B Slack channels uh, in the Fly Ranch Slack. 
And this project, gen this project generated a, a really exciting discussion and pulled together remar remarkable talents, um, still open for adoption. If any of you listeners or uh, people you know wanna join, please reach out to us. Uh, and um, we want to see where uh, can the utility be and the potential of bees uh, be at fly. So we walked the land and we met with a broad, of, uh, with a broad spectrum of experts um, still a lot of work to do. Um, and basically our goal is to establish a pollinator sanctuary at Fly Ranch in the next few years. Um, this area will be dedicated to fostering both local pollinators and honeybees while educating and inspiring the public. Uh, our ultimate goal is to implement beekeeping at Fly Ranch. And I'm gonna explain uh, in a second why and also foster uh, the local um, pollinator community there. So one of the things that I've been particularly inspired of uh, or by is what can we learn from bees as a social organism? Uh, bees come from an evolution of 120 million years. Um, and so for me, um, there's a lot of relationships just like Tim mentioned uh, people, humanity, and beehives. Um, there's many, many, many similarities and I think can be really informative and uh, an incredible experience to dive into that uh, world to uh, learn how we can improve our relationship with each other and with the planet. So the original project was um, uh, basically a pollinator garden with a dome uh, in the middle and a um, cave tree, a hollow tree that hosted a live beehive. Um, the dome would be an acoustic dome that would amplify the sound of the hive. Um, the, there would be vents to experience the smell of the hive and um, an observation um, screen so that um, visitors can really get, get up close to the hive and, and um, see the activity. And then obviously some opportunities uh, to get into the hive and learn about bees, the services, uh, the, the work that they do and how we can interact with them. Um, the tree of wildlife would be kind of the centerpiece uh, of this installation. And the idea for the honeybees part is uh, to bring a couple of colonies of carniolan bees, um, which serve uh, for the purpose of pollinator services to provide educational uh, opportunities so that we can open the hive and show uh, visitors um, up close and other ecological benefits in support of the other food projects there at Fly Ranch. Um, for uh, a couple of months ago, we met here in my house and with a group of folks to build some beehives. Um, obviously, one of our first goals is to observe. So we are still spending a ton of time and um, to uh, create a record of all the pollinator um, resources that are out there. So what flowers are flowering and when, and what are the local pollinators? We already identified about a hundred nests of alkaline bees uh, up by the geyser. And one of our first moves is to go up there and build nesting sites for these alkaline bees, which are ground nesting bees. Now the difference between the ground nesting bees and the honeybees is that you can't really have an up close interaction with the local pollinators, with the ground nesting bees, and they're asocial. So I think this could be um, an opportunity to um, also expand the knowledge and the interactive opportunities with the public with having honeybees up there. Uh, the timeline for this year. Uh, more or less has been building the nests, uh, going up there. We're probably gonna go up there in the middle of May um, um, to install uh, the ground nesting sites 
for the local pollinators. Uh, probably, hopefully, bring a couple of beehives and monitor through the year whether they're having an impact or not on the local pollinator population. Um, and then service, service and educate uh, all the people that come through um, with the guardians uh, and the nature walks there at Fly Ranch. So have uh, some informative um, materials for them to start introducing, um, introducing this, uh, this knowledge uh, during the visits. Obviously, Burning Man and Animalia, it's an awesome opportunity there uh, to, to also promote uh, and um, um, get more people to, to um, be involved with the project. Toward the end of the year, we'll write a report and see what we find out. Now, what, holds, what the future holds really depends on the type of participation. That's why I think this call is really important. We are calling for more people, more enthusiasts, more scientists, more creatives, uh, shamans, all sorts of people to, uh, uh, that are interested in bees to come and reach out to us and help us figure out what are the right questions to be asking, what are the right things to be looking at, and what are the ideas for the future. Some of the ideas that came out in our previous meetings are what does uh, the beehive of the future look like? Uh, and these are some uh, fantasy uh, inspiring designs uh, that we found. Literally, Fly Ranch is, is a blank canvas for creativity. So we're really excited to explore um, the possibilities there. And also part of the spiritual connection with bees. A lot of people I speak with um, are tremendously inspired by the connection that um, we are able to establish when we open a hive. I'm a beekeeper myself and I do have an intimate connection with my bees. And um, there's a lot of um, bee shamanism coming out. There's apitherapy um, uh, that links back uh, to many, many, many years ago. Um, and so we are definitely uh, interested in developing that body of knowledge, gather it and develop it even more. Definitely, we want to be uh, always curious and open to new ideas. And uh, I think it will be really important to um, uh, keep this work going to create opportunities for people to experience. Um, we know how that important that is important in um, our lives. And we are striving to make Fly Ranch a place for experience. Um, we so far we have about 30 people in the Fly Ranch team uh, and uh, beyond in the B team. Um, once again, please reach out to us and join the conversation. And thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Massimo. So those were our three presentations, and we want to create an opportunity now for some Q&A. So if you have any questions for any of our speakers, uh, we would love for you to throw that in the chat. We will kind of serve those up to our speakers. But you know, kind of just to start, and maybe to keep our answers short while people are asking their own questions, I wanted to ask, you know, where did your love, individual loves for bees each come from? And maybe we'll go Charlotte, Tim, and Massimo. Okay, so um, as Molly mentioned, I am not the lead of this project. I am the lead for the chapter, BWB Colombia. And so Pablo and Catalina came up to me with this wonderful idea after um, after reading articles about the UN saying that the, the bee was the most important insect in the world and talking about the, the sixth extinction and how the bee could hold basically uh, the, the key to trying to prevent this. And um, personally, I, I am scared of insects and I was so pleased when I heard that the native bees that need most of our help that are so endangered on, on our territory are stingless. <laughs> and I managed to overcome my fear by, you know, touching them and, and hanging out. And uh, so this is also a very therapeutic process for me, but I'm still very scared of spiders. <laughs> 
I'd say for me, I mean, I agree with Charlotte. I'm afraid of getting stung as well. But to me, the biggest thing about bees that I think is super cool is is just the hive. Like, I just think that that like a community a community based huge structure that houses everything they could possibly need is fascinating to me. And I know there's other animals that have similar things, but this to me is really remarkable. And it looks really cool. So that's pretty much it. For me, the love started when um, I was uh, launching a company that does bees wraps, produce bees wraps, and we use uh, beeswax. Uh, it's it's food packaging, basically reusable, sustainable food packaging. And since sustainable was part of the mission, I started getting interested in where does the beeswax come from? And uh, I opened up a Pandora box just to starting to learn about the incredible world of bees. Uh, got fascinated. I had a beekeeper friend that introduced me to it. I never had experience with uh, animals besides dogs and cats. Uh, and I was um, remarkably uh, humbled by the patience that the bees displayed toward me when I would literally crank their home open and, and pull it apart. Um, so I developed a passion there. I read a bunch of books. I realized there's so much similarity between humans as a super organism and beehives as super organism. And, and that's what's, uh, that's the passion that's driving me today. Thanks so much. Um, I see that we did get a question in the chat box and I know you responded Massimo, but for those who might not be able to read the chat box, um, Alan is asking, how can we help manage bees at Fly Ranch? And I might also um, take that one over to Charlotte after you answer your question, because Charlotte, I know you mentioned there were a couple of ways that people could support the Native Bee Project in Colombia too. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, just reach out to Fly Ranch uh, via flyranch.burningman.org or the Fly Ranch Instagram or you can sign up here in the sign-in sheet uh, that is reported here on the chat and um, we'll probably send out uh, um, an announcement later on with my email address or somebody from the group. And as for Be Safe, I'm typing in the chat right now the link to our PayPal because what is critical to us mostly is uh, financial resources. Um, however, if any of you plans to come down to Colombia, then we love to include uh, burners, bee lovers to our volunteer group and to go together, uh, spend the day on the field and, um, and work together. So that is definitely another way, all hands on deck. We have lots of hives to build, to paint, lots of attractants to place everywhere. Um, around around the habitats we're trying to repopulate. Lots of kids to hug and to play with. So this is, uh, this is definitely another way. And we're also very interested in um, any, any community um, who would have maybe a, a success case to share with us. We are learning. Uh, we don't know of any other group that is doing it in Colombia. And we would love to connect with kindred spirits and and well, learn mutually from, from one another. Charlotte, I see a couple other questions, I think, for Colombia in the chat. The first one is from Birdman asking what the name of the native bee that you're working with in Colombia is. And the second one is whether you have a problem with very mites. With what, sorry? Very, varroa mites. Varroa. Varroa mites. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. So first of all, the name of uh, the species we work with is the Angelita. This is a minuscule bee, one of the smallest, actually. It's about like five millimeters, which is like 0 0.2 inches. This is really, really small. Um, and they have a very, uh, very special properties in their honey, medicinal properties. Um, and uh, well, I could tell you about native bees. Yes, Taj, this is the Melipona. This is a subspecies. Exactly. Yes. 
Um, and so it's it's very special to to Colombia because actually the the equivalent of the Maya civilization in Colombia to make it short is the Muisca, and they were keeping and raising the bees. Um, they were using it for using them their honey for um, eye issues in particular. So this is still in the in the culture, but now it became very very artisanal and it got lost. Um, and even if it's less productive than a honeybee, obviously, well, I guess they pollinate 80% of, of the flowering plants around the world. So native bees really have their, their importance here. Um, so mites, varroa mites, says snow, are usually parasite honeybees. Okay. And he replies, because he's from Colombia and he knows, he's actually in the project as well, and no, we don't have this problem. Our main issue really has been deforestation for agricultural purposes. And, um, and so this molecule that I mentioned, which is fipronil, that is completely unregulated and the state is not doing anything to teach people how to use it properly and in moderation. So that, that is the, 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 saddest, the saddest part of our story. Right. Thanks for that answer, Charlotte. And, you know, uh, Massimo, I think we're going to queue you up for a question and then Tim will have one for you after that. You know, Massimo, you, you were mentioning that you're kind of doing these hives for both the honeybee and the native bee. Could you describe a little bit about what the differences of those are and why you're paying attention to both of those species? Yeah. So the difference with borrowing uh, bees and uh, sorry, for, with the uh, native bees and the honeybees is that the native bees that we found so far there are burrowing in the ground. That means they um, build tunnels in the sand uh, to procreate uh, and stash their food. Um, and they're solitary bees uh, versus honeybees live in societies. They're social and uh, with thousands of individuals and they usually nest inside tree cavities. So um, we thought, well, what can we do to help uh, the, the local pollinators before we start introducing different species? And um, one of the answers was, well, why don't we, it, it's very common actually around the world, even for um, uh, other types um, uh, like bumblebees, for example, to create these nests um, that are really simple. They're either, a, um, a bunch of uh, bamboo sticks together. There are already uh, tunnels, uh, wood tunnels, or just taking a simple piece of wood and drill holes into it about 12 inch long, 12 inches long. Uh, it's the simplest thing we can do and it provides them a safe habitat to, um, to nest, live, procreate. Uh, we also have to acknowledge that Fly Ranch has been for the last 100 years, uh, 150 years, a um, um, pasture for cows. And so a lot of the ground gets stomped on. Um, and there are agricultural and uh, benefits and tax benefits to that status, to that land. So there is, we have to come up with solutions that. Um, uh, help the environment without jeopardizing the benefits that already live there. So as you all know, it's a, it's a tricky situation uh, to, to make everybody happy. Uh, so um, yeah, what we're trying to do is, uh, is just create more benefits for the, for the local pollinators and more than anything, um, uh, monitor uh, the impact that we are having uh, to try to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Thanks so much, Massimo. So we're going to do one last question, and we're going to ask Tim here. Uh, you know, Tim, you know, we we know that your your design was really inspired by the bees, uh, and and has a little bit less to do with the hard facts of bees. But we wanted to ask you, as an artist, now that you've had this chance to build the man base, have you been dreaming about what you'd like to build next at Burning Man? I have uh, a couple of ideas of, of things in uh, that are kind of bumping around in my head or that I've rendered out. 
for possible projects. It's but with those, there's the need of funding. So we'll see if they happen. But uh, one involves cities because I do kind of think the hive thing inspired me a little bit more to go into kind of what is like cities all about. Um, I don't know that I would stick with animals. Um, I like to do very different things each time. So I don't know, we'll have to see. But um, it's definitely been inspiring. Like I've never done a building before and I've never done something that burns before. So both of those aspects that I had to design while doing learning how to design that way for the hive has kind of opened up new doors for me, that's for sure. Thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. for entertaining that question about your artistic visions. And thank you so much to all three of you for your answers and for sharing of yourselves and your projects in this Q&A.